Today is Thursday, May 27, 2021. Coming up on Roller Mark Unfiltered, broadcasting live from Tulsa, Oklahoma. The 100th commemoration of the Tulsa Race Massacre. Events taking place uh, over the next several days. Uh, we will be, of course, live streaming this, talking about the impact, but also not just the past, but the present and the future. We'll be talking with Councilwoman here uh, in Tulsa. Also, a brother who is the editor-in-chief of uh, the Black Wall Street Times. We're broadcasting live from their offices. Also today, uh, you'll hear from Dr. Tiffany Crutcher, as well as the artist uh, where they unveil a mural today across from the Greenwood Cultural Center. It was a, a moving, unbelievable mural, and we'll show you that as well. Also, today's show, Congressman Jim Clyburn of South Carolina will join us. We'll talk about a variety of issues, including uh, the George Floyd Justice Act. Also, uh, on today's show, Air Masayala, uh, former state prosecutor, the first African-American state prosecutor in Florida. She's running for Congress. She joins us as well. Uh, in addition, uh, we'll also talk with the Ghost Brothers. Brothers and Ghosts? Yeah, we'll talk about that as well. Folks, it's a jam-packed show. It is time to bring the funk on Roland Martin Unfiltered from Tulsa. Let's go. He's got it. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the fine. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. With entertainment just for kicks, he's rolling. One hundred years ago, on May thirty first. One hundred years ago, on May thirty first, uh, this uh, the Greenwood area in Tulsa was decimated, destroyed, uh, as white folks in this country lost their mind, killing upwards of three hundred African Americans. It, it was so stunning and devastating. We really don't even know the total number of African Americans who were killed uh, when they were attacked. Ten thousand people ended up being refugees moving all across the country, escaping the vicious racism and hatred that took place in Greenwood. Many people know about Black Wall Street. That's where it was located. It was eventually rebuilt, but the scars remain. It is still difficult to fathom what took place on, on that day uh, 100 years ago. Over the next several days, uh, there will be events taking place here in Tulsa commemorating uh, that event, many of them emotional. Uh, folks, uh, of course, you have going to have art renderings and all kinds of different concerts and things along those lines. But we have to remember, black folks lost their lives. This is a solemn occasion, in many ways, similar to how America looks at 9-11. In fact, folks, uh, there's been so much talk, not only you talk about back then, about, about the races being separated, but you still have separation happening in Tulsa. Uh, folks reached out to me uh, saying you have the, quote, white Tulsa, uh, Centennial Commission and the Black Tulsa Centennial Commission. This city and this state has yet yet to create a victim's compensation fund for the survivors. And there still are survivors as well as descendants of the folks who were impacted here in Tulsa. We're here at the offices of the Black Wall Street Times where they, where they launched today. Uh, they have a magazine and digital presence as well focused on telling the story, not only the historical story, but what's, what's actually happening today. And one of the folks who's on the front lines of this uh, is my first guest. Uh, she's a councilwoman here uh, in Tulsa. Uh, Vanessa Hall Harper, she joins us right now. I'm glad to have you on Roller Martin Unfiltered. Thank you so much for bringing Unfiltered to Tulsa. I'm a huge fan. Well, I certainly appreciate <laughs> and it. And my so, frat brother, too. All right, then. Well, we, we, we had to be here. We had to be here to, uh, to tell this story. Um, first of all, how long have you been on the council? I won my first election in 2016, so I'm serving my third uh, term. I was talking earlier 
uh, to uh, Dr. Tiffany Crutcher, yes. and she was talking about uh, the battle that, 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 that you've been involved in uh, when it come, came to a victim's compensation fund and getting this city in this state, not just to sit here and mark this event and not do what I actually called, and some people, again, don't get offended by this, folks, here you had uh, black pain by cause 100 years ago, mm -hmm. but now you have what I call black porn where folks want to benefit financially but don't want to still provide compensation to the, to the living, to the three survivors mm -hmm. and the descendants who were impacted by, by uh, this massacre. That's, that's absolutely, I love that term. I call it empty symbolism. We're good at that in Tulsa. We're good at looking like we're doing something, trying to look like we're not racist. But in the meantime and in between time, we're not doing anything that's going to really uh, repair, that's going to restore, that's going to atone. And that's what we're good at in Tulsa. And, then, and in the state, we're good at doing those things. But when we're talking about putting initiatives in place that's going to actually change the status quo, that's going to improve quality of life, that's going to change the trajectory of a community, because the community is still suffering too. Right. Certainly the victims and, and their descendants, but the community as a whole continues to suffer as a result of the massacre. And so very little. You know, but what we have to do first is, a, is apologize officially and then work on atonement. And that's not really what we're good at. We're good at telling, we're good telling you what you're going to get. We're going to give you this. We're going to give you this history center. We're going to give you that, and you need to accept it as reparations. No. And see, it was, so I remember um, years ago when uh, Professor Charles Ogletree uh, and other lawyers, I think Johnny Cochran was involved, yes. Willie Gary, they came to the Congressional Black Caucus yes. Foundation with, with uh, a number of the survivors. Yes. Uh, it, is, it, you know, it is down to three. Uh, it, it's unfortunate uh, uh, Charles can't be here. He's suffering from Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I remember, again, folks were talking about, they were talking about fighting for reparations. So the state set up a commission. Yes. Okay. You said, apologize. So Oklahoma and Tulsa has never officially offer an apology? So what did they actually do? Uh, from those recommendations, not very much. They had started the mass graves investigations 20 years ago, but the mayor at that time stopped it. And so we, we've had... And, and, and explain to people what the mass graves investigation is. Okay, so there are, we know that there are mass graves uh, throughout this community. Uh, we know of some through historical uh, recollections specifically where they are, but we know that there's rumors of other, of other locations. And so 20 years ago, there, that investigation started to uncover where these mass graves were. Uh, but at the time, the mayor stopped it. It was too mm. divisive for whatever reason. Who knows what the reasons were? And so that was something that was started, but it, but it, it abruptly ended. Uh, we've had the mayor uh, some years ago say, I apologize, but there was no atonement, right? There was nothing following up, so it's empty. So it was a statement. It was a statement. We've even had the chief of police, our former chief of police said he apologized, but nothing to follow. Certainly not any policies that we know still impact the black community detrimentally in our, in our city. And so it's all empty promises. It's, it's all empty symbolism. I see the, his, the Greenwood History Center uh, as, a, as, a, as a symbolism. And I'm, for one, I'm just sick of the symbolism. I'm not going to go to any more tree dedications. I'm not going to any more bench dedications, park dedications. I'm sick of all of that because none of that improves the quality of life from our community. None of that atones. None of it. It's empty symbolism. And so that's, again, that's what we're good at as a city, and I, for one, will not participate in it. The, when we talk about, and I was sharing this earlier um, with a couple of folks out at, at, the, at the mural unveiling. Yes. 9-11 took place. This country created a victim's compensation fund. Like that. All right, you got, you, got, you got white folks in America who is, they're scared to death of, rep, of the, of the, of the, of the uh, title reparations. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. We literally created a victim compensations fund. Mm -hmm. What took place on 9-11 wasn't done by the taxpayers. Hmm. That was done largely by Saudi terrorists. Saudi Arabia didn't pay for sure that. Did. The American government did. Exactly. And so my, my, my question again is, why is it so hard for Tulsa to say we're going to do this? Are, are, are the, all these events they're having, are they selling tickets? Yes. 
I'm okay. sure. Some are of them they, are. So, so the question for me is, is a portion of those ticket sales going to a victim compensation fund? Uh, I, I, anything. So, so basically, uh, and, and again, for the people at home, so the black folks are having stuff tomorrow through Monday. Free. And then... Mm -hmm. The, the white folks, the, the official commission, mm -hmm. their stuff begins Monday and it goes, go, goes through the whole week. No, they've been having events for, for the last month. So is there anything in that official commission that has created an economic pathway for descendants as well as survivors? Not to my knowledge. And that's been my question. Where the museum or history center is being built, who owns that land? Who's going to benefit? That's tourism. There's dollars attached to that. And that's my whole point. That's my, I know. Because, I know. See, because when I think of tourism, my, here's my, and again, I, I, I'm just thinking out loud. Yeah. If, if I'm thinking about a victim's compensation fund, that means that, all right, if you're coming, if you're coming to Tulsa for these tourist events, mm -hmm. that means that hotels are Hotel. benefiting. That means that if you get a victim, victim's compensation fund, a portion of the hotel uh, uh, dollars should be flowing into that fund. If you're going to be having these annual events and restaurants are benefiting, uh, res those receipts, dollars should be flowing into these funds. So th th there is a way Absolutely. to create a victim's compensation fund where they are benefiting from these tourist dollars, mm -hmm. but this tourism is literally coming to, exper to experience black pain. Exactly. Which Profiting I call also black porn. Profiting, Profiting off of it. Off so the of city it. of Tulsa and restaurants and hotels are profiting off of black pain and not going back to black people. Exactly. Exactly. That's it. You, you've summed it up. At the end of the day, black lives do not matter. You know, they want to say, well, they don't like that. Well, that's a political statement, blah, blah, blah. At the end of the day, we decide every day with the decisions that we make, and we prove that black lives do not matter. And this is just one telltale example of that. They, they do not care when it comes to it. It's about money. It's about power. It's about land. Right? Because reparations for me are two things. Greenbacks, cash, and land. God isn't making any more of it. And that's what we have lost. And in addition to that is our ability for generational wealth. So that we can say, I'm passing something on to my great-grandchild, or, and et cetera. And so they know that because they've done it in white society. Mm -hmm. Right? That's how this country has been built. But when it comes to the black community, it does not matter. Black lives do not matter. And, and all we are seen as, as a commodity, right? We are consumers. We're not owners, we're consumers. And that's the state that they want to keep us in. And so the policies that they're going to pass, the programs, the initiatives that they're going to pursue are going to keep us in that mindset or in that situation that we're just consuming, but we're not owning for, our, for ourselves. So for, final question for you. So the people who are watching, the people who are listening, what do you want them to do? If they're coming here, if people are coming here this week, what should they be saying? If people are going to be visiting Tulsa over the next year, if they want to visit the Greenwood area, what should they be saying and doing when they come? Well, I think they should certainly support as many black businesses as they can. Um, I mean, be intentional when you come be here. Be very intentional when you come here to do that. But more than anything, we need your voice, not only when you're here, but when you go back home mm -hmm. to continue to be that voice in your communities and to push Tulsa, Oklahoma, to do the right thing. Get involved with credible black organizations and institutions. The Black Wall Street Chamber of Commerce. Join the Black Wall Street Chamber of Commerce and provide your resources there because our goal through these institutions is to recreate the, the history, the spirit of Black Wall Street because we, we have the blueprint. Right? We know what can possibly happen when we are left alone so that we can build our own communities and, and given every opportunity. But we know what systemic and, and institutionalized racism does and its plan, that is to keep us out of the game, to keep us uh, away from those opportunities and to keep us uh, in, a, in a maintaining of status quo type situation. So support black organizations and institutions in this community. Do you have one more question? Okay, yes. so you mentioned, so there's the Greenwood Cultural Center. Yes. Then they're having this museum they're dedicating. History Center, yeah. What the hell is the purpose of a second museum? Exactly. I mean, why not, why not come and say, hey, there's already one here. How about if we partner and expand this? I mean, so, so like... I'm so glad you brought that up because that was the initial plan. The power structure, the philanthropic organizations, the corporations in this community, they said initially that we're going to expand the Greenwood Cultural Center. But if we give you this money, we want you to change your organizational structure. 
we want to come in, we want so many seats on your board. They tried to change and again and just take away that, that existing power structure. That board said, no, we're not going to do that. So they took their ball and went down the street. <laughs> so most, a lot of people don't know that. A lot of people don't know that. And there were many attempts at trying to look. If you're going to really do b right by this community, right. improve upon, and by the way, Greenwood Cultural Center, state funds stopped 15 years ago, and the building has just basically been deteriorating. So our system, the city as well as the state, did not fund this, this building. But now because we're approaching the 100-year centennial, now there's this rush, right, to p put some lipstick on the barn. You know, let's put some lipstick on the pig mm. type thing. And that's what we see taking place here. That's why I'm, I'm very uh, uh, concerned and, and will not attend these events that I know are just facades. They're not really concerned or, 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 or focused on really doing right, atoning, repairing, reparations. That's not the goal. The goal is let's get past this 100-year centennial and, and maintain the status quo that we've established here. Tourism, okay, we because we've hidden the story for for, for decades, right? right? So now, but now so, that it's out there, right? Right. So so now, how can we break, that, make right, that money? Right, right. Just like what you said. And that, and it's that's porn. and, and, it's, and, it's and, and that's the thing pimping. that I think that, that that we have to understand, and which means that if you come here, be very deliberate, say something, do something, yeah, and so ask. You don't have to. You'll find somebody that's going to give you the real deal. So no, that's not what you want to go to. That's right. not where you want to support. You want to support over here. Because this support over here is about improving our quality of life, improving our community. And that is not. All right. Councilwoman Vanessa hill we appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much Thanks for coming. Thanks so very much. Uh, as I said, folks, uh, we uh, have been here. We, 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 we you know, going to continue to be here um, uh, talking about what's going on here. Uh, a little bit earlier today, there was an unveiling of a mural across from uh, the Greenwood Cultural Center. Powerful, powerful mural. Uh, we had an opportunity to live stream that event. If you want to see the full uh, stream, simply go to our YouTube channel. Uh, but I had an opportunity to talk with uh, the uh, artist as well as Dr. Tiffany Crutcher. Uh, many of you know we had her on the show. Her brother Terrence Crutcher uh, was shot and killed, uh, her twin brother. Uh, so we had an opportunity to talk with uh, her as well as uh, Christy about that mural and how important it is to this community. Here's that conversation. With the, with the unveiling uh, of this mural. Mm -hmm. This mural um, is truth. I've always, I've been just, just really um, arguing the fact that I'm so sick of murals. That's what this city has been giving us for reparations. They gave us some park benches to sit and reflect about what happened. Even a tree, they dedicated a tree. But something like this that comes from us, that tells the truth. You know, the murals this city want to give us is Jackie Robinson. You know, they had no no ties to, to the city and this massacre. Mm -hmm. um, and my great aunt Janie was in the Dreamland Theater when the massacre happened. And she escaped. And just to see those ladies running out of there, it just hit me. It, it just hit me in all the years of us hitting this sidewalk and people saying, what are y'all doing out here protesting? That's stupid and doing this. And now people are finally hearing. And as Dr. Crutcher, my good friend here, always tells me, it's not what you say, but what you keep saying. Mm -hmm. And today, I just felt heard. I felt heard. Mm -hmm. It's not reparations, but it's our, it's our voice when you come in this district. Mm -hmm. It's our voice when you, when, when you see it. Um, and, and, and it's raw and it's, they need, people need to see what happened, especially since uh, Kevin Stitt um, signed this House Bill 1775 where we can't teach about the history and what happened to us um, because it makes white people uncomfortable, you know, and people keep saying, well, Christy, racism is everywhere. Mass, uh, massacres happened everywhere, but we're unique because before this state became a state, it was Indian territory, and only people who could own land here was black and natives. So we want our land back. We owned a third of eastern Oklahoma. This is huge. We had land. We had wealth, and people need to know that. Our people need to know that. That was one of the things that um, I sort of explained to people, because uh, folks say, well, uh, Black Wall Street burned down, but then was rebuilt. I said, yeah, but what would it be like if those resources had not had to be spent to rebuild? Mm -hmm. Where would African Americans be? We, we, we talk about the, accumu the, 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 the accumulation of wealth. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reality, I think what you're seeing is with that particular bill, I think with all these attacks on critical race theory, mm -hmm. uh, and I have a book coming out next year called White Fear. Mm -hmm. what, 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 what we're dealing with is really 
uh, white, there are some white Americans who are absolutely afraid of others knowing the real history of mm -hmm. America and what happened. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and as you talk about, you know, yes, Greenwood was rebuilt um, by 1925 better than what it was before. But, you know, by 1920, Oklahoma had over 50 black townships from freedmen, freedmen, land, they own that land, these townships. That's what helped rebuild Greenwood. It was those 50 other black townships. We had a network of black communities mm -hmm. across this state. And so that's what rebuilt it. And so not only are we fighting this state, white supremacist this system, we are also fighting the tribes who kicked us out of the tribes, who kicked their black people mm -hmm. out of the tribes. You know, and, and we want what belongs to us. So we, we have a two-edged sword here we're fighting, a double-edged sword. Uh, Dr. Crutcher, you made a remark uh, at the opening when you said there are people who are going to be coming here uh, who, are, who are tourists. Um, and when I looked at the schedule, I see this here, but you also the city. There's uh, so this uh, arts district uh, that's going to be unveiling all these different things. Um, but, but what do you want African Americans uh, who come here to say and do? And, and those folks across the country who are watching this, uh, who are not going to be here, uh, what they should be saying about what should be happening with the descendants? Of what the people who live here, of what was taken from our people? Well, absolutely. I mean, people are going to be coming from all over, but in particularly black people to pay homage. Um, but again, as, as some of the individuals said today, we didn't learn about it. As black people, as a descendant, I didn't learn about it. And so I hope that they will come and truly learn what took place on this sacred soil. We consider all of this a crime scene still because there's been no atonement. There's been no repair, no reparations, no justice. And so I want them to understand that and feel that and take their shoes off and put their feet on this blood-stained soil and realize that ancestors are speaking out from this soil asking why, mm -hmm. asking why. And so this isn't just a festival. I want for people to understand it's not about the music. It's not about John P. Key, P.J. Morton, John Legend, anybody. This is about justice. We have three last known living survivors who are here who clawed their way through some of the worst times jim crow the civil rights movement in our nation's history and they're here and that's what it's supposed to be about that's who it should be about and their descendants and so i need for people to be screaming reparations now reparations now nothing else and, and so that's what mm -hmm. i want for people to get that's the message and you can't have reconciliation it's become a big business without the truth. And so we'll be spreading truth this weekend. That's right. Well, when I was, uh, when we were driving in, um, what I, because again, it's very interesting in this country uh, how certain words uh, mean different things and it's scare folks. Uh, so you got the people out there who are, uh, who are white, who, oh my God, hey, reparations. I said, okay, 9-11, there was a victim compensation fund. Mm -hmm. that the federal government established. Now, uh, there were people who were impacted by it. Uh, that wasn't, some will, some will, other folks will say, but it wasn't caused by the federal government. Mm -hmm. But the federal government created a victim compensation fund mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that was established. Okay, so people are afraid of reparations. Okay, mm -hmm. create a victim compensation that's right fund that's right <laughs> in Tulsa and in Oklahoma mm -hmm. uh, and they're gonna and then of course you know you're gonna have all, all these different events mm -hmm. but do you also say that those resources that are being spent that's where the creation of the victim compensation fund should start it definitely should it definitely should you know right now our only black city councilor Vanessa Hall Harper she's not here right now because she's fighting with the city legal department on that very thing right now and so we are fighting for that it needs to happen you know and and I and I keep going back to this to this Creek Nation because they just got a million dollars in CARES Act funds <laughs> and just imagine how much that could help black people freedmen's you know, and, and, and they constantly, this city and this state has constantly funded all kinds of stuff, you know, just like the, 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 the Greenwood Rising uh, Museum, $30 million they raised for that. Not one dime of that is going to any of the, the, the victims, the survivors. That's who it should go to. 
They haven't done any of that. It's all this lipstick on a pig. And, and just and just so folks again who are not here, so so Tiffany, explain to folks what the what the Greenwood Cultural Center is, and then what museum she just spoke <laughs> of, because there's a difference. Well, the G Greenwood Cultural Center was founded, and, and I hate to say this, by the late former state senator Maxine Horner and, and, and Don Ross, Representative Don Ross. They were mm -hmm. legends in this community. She recently passed away this past, I think, February, uh, and she went to her grave fighting for this community. She established the first 1921 Tulsa Race Riot Commission that mm -hmm. established four demands, four points reparations for this community to explore what happened, uh, to build a memorial, and to give scholarships for descendants of survivors. And not one of those demands have been met. And so she founded this, this, this cultural center, which is a staple in our community. Uh, this is where we do all of our events. We have, have history and art uh, dedicated to, to what happened, the truth. And so this is the building. If you want to make a donation, you need to make a donation to the Greenwood Cultural Center mm -hmm. in Maxine Horner's honor. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're north, north of this highway, the IDL. That's what destroyed Greenwood yet again. Destroyed it, devastated it. And so north of the IDL is where all of, of, of the pre predominantly black Tulsans live. South of the IDL, you see high rises, you see condos, you see rooftops. So, so explain to the folks here because We've been we covered the story as well, and, and some people are just uh, confused by this, not understanding how highways were created to split black communities. So when you say mm -hmm. when you say uh, that destroyed it, explain that to those who, who are mm -hmm, watching. Mm -hmm. A part of the model cities and and a part of what the LBJ administration put these highways through the, a lot of major inner cities throughout this country, mm -hmm. and you know you notice there's no exits, there's no exits here. And so that really cut right into the heart. The Red Wing Hotel was right there. J.B. Stratford Hotel, the uh, Dreamland Theater. And, 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 the, and just swing around just to show mm -hmm. the highway. Swing the camera around, keep talking. Yes. Just swing around okay. to show the highway. Yeah, so, so that highway has really um, put a, you know, I, I always say Greenwood what is the heartbeat to all those other black communities. Okay. And that's a major artery right there. Mm -hmm. And it has really stopped a lot of people from coming here. Um, right now, the businesses on Greenwood, they don't, they don't even have any parking. Mm -hmm. can't go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, again, <laughs> um, Christy said something earlier that we rebuilt bigger and better, but I, I always have to just push back a little bit. Some people right. rebuilt, some, because 10,000 people were displaced and scattered all over the United States. Mm -hmm. They had to flee not as immigrants, but as refugees, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to white racial terror, terror violence, anti-black racism, white supremacy. And we're calling this weekend homecoming. Mm -hmm. You know, Greenwood, Black Wall Street is everywhere. It's a spirit, it's a yeah. mindset. Yeah. And so we're hoping that we can be the model. Uh, we have one opportunity, and this is the weekend that we gotta scream to the top of our lungs. We want justice, we want reparations. And if we can get it here, we can get HR 40. Uh, that's Congress. Joining us right now is Congressman Jim Clyburn of South Carolina. Uh, he uh, joins us. Congressman, how are you doing? Roland, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I am here uh, in Tulsa, Oklahoma for the 100th uh, centennial uh, of the, to, to commemorate the Tulsa uh, race massacre. Uh, and the, part of the problem uh, a lot of people have, Congressman, is that America has not properly uh, created a victim's compensation fund for the survivors and their descendants. The state of Oklahoma hasn't done anything. The city of Tulsa hasn't done anything. Folks say that they are tired of just uh, trees and benches and murals and parks and events along those lines, that America needs to properly atone for its past, especially when you have survivors who still are with us. Your thoughts on that? Well, once again, thank you very much for having me. But, you know, uh, I don't disagree with any of that. Uh, I think that's what H.R. 40 is all about. Uh, John Conyers uh, filed that bill every year. Uh, I've been in Congress now for almost 30 years. Uh, and John Conyers, I think, filed that bill uh, every year that I've been there. Uh, and um, uh, when he 
uh, was no longer in Congress, uh, and we had Sheila Jackson Lee uh, took up that legislation, and she has filed H.R. 40. Now, H.R. 40 is simply to establish uh, a committee or commission to study this whole issue and make recommendations. And that's what we ought to be about. And I think you are very wise uh, in using the term you just used because uh, people uh, have allowed the word reparations uh, to take on an ominous meaning. Uh, Reparations, the root word for reparations is repair. That's what the root word is. So how do you atone? How do you repair? I think you've heard me say this. Um, I uh, have studied Alexis de Tocqueville. Uh, De Tocqueville uh, wrote a two-volume work uh, called Democracy in America. And and I think he can sum up that work uh, with one sentence uh, from those two volumes. And it's this. America is not great because it is more enlightened than any other nation, but rather because it has always been able to repair its faults. Repair its faults. Tulsa was a fault. And Hamburg, here in South Carolina, was a fault. Uh, You know, I'm at the little South Carolina state, and everybody talk about these HBCUs, but I had no problem. I'm shocked when I hear people say they never heard of Tulsa. I knew about Tulsa uh, as a college student, uh, and you know how old I am, so you know how long ago that was. Um, I knew about Tulsa. I knew about Hamburg uh, in South Carolina. Uh, what was the name of, uh, down there in in, in, um, uh, 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 in Florida? I knew about all these things. Uh, and I have studied right. them. In fact, uh, the book that really got me kick-started on this history stuff was from slavery uh, to freedom. John Hope Franklin, a native of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, when I wrote my book, Blessed Experiences, who did I ask to write the foreword? And she uh, did it for me. Alfred Woodard, a native of Tulsa, Oklahoma. So all I'm saying mm-hmm. is I'm in touch with all of this. And I get a little bit disturbed when people come uh, talking to me as if I, I, I'm a newcomer to this or I don't know what I'm talking about. I've known this stuff, and I've studied it, and I work hard as I possibly can to do what we can to overcome it. So I'm a co-sponsor of HR 40. But that is a study, and we ought so to the question look. Is, yeah. So, Congressman, i got to ask you, are, do you believe the votes are there? Will 218 Democrats, I, I, was, I don't think any Republican is even going to even think about it, but are the votes there? for the Democrats to approve it? At this particular juncture, I don't think so. You know, I'm the vote counter, and I don't believe in misrepresenting things. I know people get around talking about, well, you know, I think so. Not, no, I don't think the votes are there yet, and I think it's because we have got to do a better job of educating people as to what we're uh, uh, talking about. Every time I hear the term reparations, people start talking about financial remuneration. Indulge me for a moment. My late wife, who you knew very well, uh, we stayed married for 58 years. On her mother's side, her great-grandfather was a white guy uh, down in Charleston, South Carolina. Her mother was a mulatto, and she was able to get educated uh, and others in her family at Avery Institute that was established for mulattoes. On her daddy's side, none of that. So how do you determine this kind of stuff? That's why we got to have this study. And that's why people of goodwill need to come together and say, what can we do uh, to atone? And I think I like that word. That's a biblical word. To atone uh, for these past sins and the way uh, get the good committed together, and I'm trying to get everybody in the Democratic caucus and hope with some Republicans will join us 
to vote for H.R. 40 so they can set up this study and get people of goodwill to sit down around a table or tables and come up with a proper way for us to atone uh, for Tulsa and a lot of other things. Hamburg, too, and I want to leave South Carolina out. Well, that's, that, that, that is critically important. So obviously, uh, as someone, as you said, you're the one responsible for counting those votes. Uh, so you certainly would know. Um, and, and, and you're absolutely right. Uh, but look, here's the deal, Congress, and we also know this here. It's a whole bunch of words that white people uh, get scared of because they don't actually want to deal with the issue. The folks did got a problem with Black Lives Matter. The folks got a problem with reparations. Uh, now you got conservatives running around hollering, mad, upset, passing laws to get rid of critical race theory when that's not even taught in elementary and junior high and high schools. At the end of the day, I think what we are dealing with, Congressman, is white fear in this country. We're dealing with people who do not, that's why they hate the 1619 Project. That's why they can't stand Afro-American studies. That's why they can't stand any of this, because I just fundamentally believe, Congressman, and what they're really upset about the most is that you and I and Greg Carr and Reese and Amisha, my panelists, we all get to have an opinion, and they mad that we now can talk, and, we don't, and we're not going to get lynched for talking back to them. That's just where I think, just where we are. And so I, I think this is the struggle we're dealing with, and black folks gonna be, must be prepared for it because they're going to fight any effort to truly educate Americans about real history as opposed to his story. You are exactly right. I agree with that totally. Uh, you know, I've studied history all my life. I started out studying this stuff when I was eight, eight years old, and I still I used to teach it, and I still study it daily. And you are exactly right. And I think that if we get more people to understand, that this, and I think this fair is made up. I don't think there's any actual fair. I think they're using this as a cover. Everybody knows that Donald Trump is lying, but they use that big lie as a cover. If you go back and look at the Tulsa uh, massacre, uh, that was a lie. Uh, that gentleman that I just wrote about on that elevator accused falsely of assaulting a white woman on elevator operator, they found out that it was not true. And But they acted on a lie, killed eight, uh, 300 people, destroyed a whole uh, business district, all on a lie. That's the same thing that happened on January 6th an insurrection at the Capitol on a lie. So we've got to begin but Congressman, to... But Congressman, yeah. but, but remember, Jan, but Congressman, but January 6th was a repudiation of black votes. Donald Trump specifically mentioned Detroit, specifically mentioned Atlanta, specifically mentioned Philadelphia, uh, specifically uh, mentioned Milwaukee. They were, re they were repudiating and they were angry about black votes. He did not mention places where there were mostly white voters. I think we can't leave that out. That was, that was driving January 6th. Absolutely. I'm not leaving that out. That's what I'm talking about. Yes, sir. Fulton County, I know, you know what Fulton County, Georgia is all about. You know what Detroit, uh, yep. the vote, vote in Detroit and Philadelphia are all about. Those are black votes. And they lied on black people saying they were cheating. They weren't cheating. They were just showing up. And they didn't expect for them to show up. So they made up a big lie. And so that lie is a cover for them to do the kind of things they're trying to do. That's all I'm saying. You make my point. Yes, sir. Yeah. And well, that's and also Carolyn Bryant, who lied about Emmett Till, is still living and has never been brought to justice for contributing to his death as well. Um, lastly, the, uh, I got to ask you this here before before I uh, go ahead. I said, and she admitted she admitted that she's lied and everybody act like they never heard her admission. 
Absolutely. I got to ask you this here. Uh, the negotiations are continuing in the Senate. Um, uh, I talked to Attorney Ben Crump and the George Floyd family the other day. Uh, they made perfectly clear they want a strong bill signed uh, by President Biden. Uh, and they and they also say there has to be accountability in that bill when it comes to uh, when it comes to um, um, uh, police uh, 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 and, and immunity. And so uh, a lot of people have criticized you uh, for your comments with regards to that. Do you believe at the end of the day that qualified immunity or a portion of it or something related to it is going to be in the final version of that could very well be passed the United States Senate. Yes, I think it will be. And I said that it should be. And, you know, I know people ought to listen. I said right at the top of my comments, I believe in the old Lyndon Johnson theory that a half loaf is better than no loaf at all. Now, a full loaf is for us to get rid of qualified immunity. No loaf at all is to keep it as it is. So what is the half loaf? The half loaf, is, to me, is defining qualified immunity as to what the word really says. Look in the Black Law Dictionary, which I've done. Qualified in the Black Law Dictionary says limited, limited. But we are treating qualified immunity as absolute, and it's not absolute. Now, I've heard from a bunch of people in the last uh, several days thanking me so much uh, for bringing out the differences in those two words. So if people would just listen to what I said, instead of jumping up, just getting up. For some reason, we just like to think the worst about each other. You know, I'm 80 years old. I've been fighting this stuff. I met my wife in jail <laughs> fighting for this stuff. So I ain't ever going to be against the best interests of people of color. So, yes, yeah, qualified immunity doesn't mean absolute. It means limited. And that's what I said. That's what I meant. And I wish people would just listen and stop jumping on Twitter or whatever they jump on and misrepresent what I said. All right, Congressman Jim Clyburn, we certainly appreciate it. Uh, thank you so very much for joining us uh, as we uh, broadcast it live from Tulsa. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Well, I, I hope you're there when I get there Sunday. I'll be there uh, at the AME Church with that Vernon AME Church Sunday morning. Uh, yeah, Vernon AME, uh, we, we will be there and we'll be broadcasting uh, as well. Uh, we're here until Wednesday, so I'll see you on Sunday. Okay, buddy. All right. Thank you so very much. Uh, I want to bring up uh, my panel right now. Uh, Dr. Greg Carr, Chair of the Department of Afro-American Studies at Howard University, Reese Colbert. Colbert, Black Women's Views, and Amisha Cross, Democratic Strategist. Glad to have all three of you here. Uh, I want to start with the historian. Um, it, it, it is very clear, Greg, uh, that there still is a wide divide here in Tulsa. Um, when you look at what people are saying here. Uh, it was very interesting to me talking to people before even coming here. But they were real clear. They were like, hey, don't go to the white folk stuff. Go to the black folk stuff, Roland. Don't do anything with them. Uh, and so, uh, you know, and uh, there have been so folks have been trying to get Stacey Abrams to pull out because she's going to be scheduled to speak. Hill Harper excuse, is going to be holding an event. John Lett is performing. And so even with this, the racial divide is still clear is present uh, and it's unmovable. It is, and with all due respect to our elder Congressman uh, Clyburn, and, and I first think of him as a student and a teacher of history, uh, there's no evidence, and I know he knows that as well as most, there's no evidence that anything in Tulsa is anything other than business as usual. Um, I think about the words of Mother Fletcher, Mother Viola Fletcher, last week when she said, I'm 107 years old, I've never seen justice. I think about the horrors inflicted on black people in this country every day. And as we heard, and brother, thank you, first of all, for being there and in being there when you talk to Counselor uh, um, uh, Hall Harper and when you talk to uh, Sister Chrissy and uh, Dr. Crutcher, they really framed what is going on in Tulsa. Tulsa is a microcosm of everything that has happened to us in this country. State violence, mob rule. Uh, land theft. The reason there are black people in Oklahoma is because many of them got marched out there during the Trail of Tears. When you heard Chrissy talk about the Creek Nation, those Native Americans had Africans enslaved, and in a treaty the government had in 1866 with them, 
did not extend them the land rights. The reason that black people are in Tulsa, in part, and they had success up to the 1920s at Black Wall Street, was because they had land that they owned, and then many of them had come from all black towns like Renchersville, Oklahoma, which is where John O'Flankin's father is from. I say all that as backdrop to say this. Yes, Chrissy was right. Black Wall Street built back bigger. By the 1940s, they had more than 250 businesses. And as Dr. Crutcher said, one of the people that wasn't able to stay there was Mother Fletcher, who had to move out to California and who never finished the fourth grade, who just finished the fourth grade. But what happened after 1940? The war on Black Wall Street is the war that we saw everywhere. Representative Clyburn just said it. What destroyed Black Wall Street finally? Desegregation, which then saw the drain on the businesses, economic decline, and then so-called urban renewal in the 1970s, leading to the construction of U.S. Highway 50, uh, 75, redlining, no loans for black people to buy houses and businesses. And so finally, Roland, when you say the divide is in Tulsa, yes, it's called Highway 75, and it is symbolic of the divide in this country. So John Legend, Stacey Abram, all the rest of y'all, y'all need to stay our ass off of the stage with those open enemies of black people. Hmm. Reese, uh, what really jumps out here um, is so many people just in, in this city, in this state, in this country having no understanding of real history. And that's why uh, when you see these attacks on the teaching of real history, when you see the attacks uh, from Republicans and from the, all these MAGA people, it's because they do not want the real story told. And what's killing them is we, guess what? We get to own our own damn cameras. We can go travel where we want to travel. We can tell the story. And that's what they can't handle. Yeah, and what's so ironic is that in recent history, it has, we've learned more, I shouldn't say we, but like, the, the society as a whole has learned more and has done more to acknowledge uh, the Tulsa massacre and fiction shows. Like, for instance, Watchmen, the backdrop of Watchmen with Regina, Regina King was the Tulsa massacre. And in that fictional version, there were preparations and things of that nature, as well as love care country. But it's going back to your point that you made earlier about black trauma porn, and I don't think that it was done in a, in a distasteful way in those shows. We're it's, it's, it's being talked about and for entertainment and not so much as what we're going to actually do about it. And so there are people do feel threatened by the truth, but it, it kind of, when, when it can be presented in entertainment fashion, then people are a little bit more open to it. But I didn't, one thing I didn't hear mentioned in any of the discussion was the Tulsa Greenwood Massacre Accountability Claims Act that um, Hank, uh, Representative Hank Johnson just introduced in Congress on May 21st. It was also previously by John Connors, or Congressman John, Congressman John Connors. Um, I know Congressman Clyburn brought up the H.R. 40 Commission, but this, uh, this Tulsa Greenwood Massacre Act actually goes directly to the heart of reparations for Tulsa specifically. Um, and so that's something that doesn't have a great deal of co-sponsors. I think it's only 18 co-sponsors in, in, the, in the House. There's no introduction in the Senate. So now would be a great time to galvanize behind that. Everybody was sharing the the, the very um, just heart wrenching and, and and just gut wrenching um, testimony of, of the survivors. But what are y'all gonna do about it? There's no reason why there shouldn't be an introduction in the Senate. Uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren, who's from Oklahoma, introduced the resolution. The Oklahoma Senator uh, James Lankford introduced the resolution. Where is the reparations bill in the Senate? Why aren't all the CBC members in both chambers sponsoring this and really galvanizing behind this? And why isn't Black social media, who is so up in arms about where is our Black bill, why are they not getting behind it? And so it's not going to solve everything with one snap of a finger, but at a minimum, when you do have tangible solutions that are being proposed, there should be more galvanization behind it. There should be, we should be as on message about the post in the back as people are on message being mad about the COVID-19. Uh, Amisha, um, the folks here are making it clear the demands are going to continue, uh, and, and I dare say they should, and it should be a, a, a constant fight to say, no, you create that victim's compensation fund, and don't you dare try to make money off of the Tulsa race massacre. 
Absolutely. And I'm thankful that you're there and for the interviews that you've conducted. Thus far. I think that there's so many people who still don't fully understand or know the historical relevance of Tulsa and just how deeply wrought a lot of the violence happened to be. And to the point that we still don't have a, a, an accountability or an account for just exactly how many African-Americans actually died that day. I think that this is such a tragic instance of um, of just white supremacy and brutality and that we still have not seen any type of resolution, any type of move forward, any type of full recognition on the part of not only the state, but also the national government um, in, in regards to the families and those that were lost during that terrible time. And I think that to continue to highlight, to talk about this, not only in the sense of Hollywood basically reimagining the event and using it for not just trauma porn, but also to perpetuate other, um, other, other movies and films, but utilizing it in a sense as an educational tool, but also a tool to ensure that um, the African-American families that suffered, the Native American families that suffered, actually get their due because Tulsa and Oklahoma as a whole has been so much to the Black community. And I think that that's often forgotten about in conversations about civil rights, about justice, um, outside of this, this annual you know, remembrance and celebration. These are things that we need to continue to highlight. This is something that we need to continue you know, pressing the pavement for because for more people, this country has ignored the fact that they were thriving after the They were thriving but also business and entrepreneurship was the name of the game. Also was one of the forebears of that. And that's something that matters. And it's something that we should continue to fight for, not only in terms of the but also in terms of regarding the game of those left behind who were so dismantled by that tragedy. Folks, hold it tight right there. We've got to go to a break. We come back. We're going to talk with uh, Aramis Ayala, the first African-American elected as a uh, state attorney, prosecutor there in Florida. She's running for Congress. We'll also be talking with the founder and editor-in-chief of the Black Wall Street Times uh, the, the, uh, uh, right here um, uh, in uh, uh, here in Tulsa, folks, as we, uh, again, continue our coverage. Lots more to talk about right here on Roland Martin Unfiltered. Back in a moment. Racial injustice is a scourge on this nation, and the black community has felt it for generations. We have an obligation to do something about it. Whether it's canceling student debt, increasing the minimum wage, or investing in black-owned businesses, the black community deserves so much better. I'm Nina Turner, and I'm running for Congress to do something about it. Shortly after 9-11, America and its allies went to war in Afghanistan to defeat a terrorist stronghold. We accomplished that mission years ago. Trillions of dollars lost, over 2,000 Americans dead, countless Afghans dead. It's time to get out. Many presidents have tried to end the war in Afghanistan, but President Biden is actually going to do it. And by 9-11, over 20 years after the war was started, the last American soldier will depart, and America's longest war will be over. Promise made, promise kept. Carl Payne pretended to be Roland Martin. Holla! Hi, I'm Chaley Rose, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. <laughs> All right, folks, welcome back to Roland Martin Unfiltered, broadcasting live here uh, from Tulsa in the offices of uh, the Black Wall Street Times. Uh, Aramis Ayala, uh, of course, uh, she, uh, many, we talked to her many times when she was a uh, state's attorney there in Florida. Well, with um, Congresswoman Val Demings indicating that she is going to be making a bid for the United States Senate. Aramis Ayala is one of the folks who is running for that congressional seat. She joins us right now. How you doing? Hey, I'm good. How are you? 
doing great. So you uh, you chose not to run for re-election as state's attorney. State's attorney, why do you want to go to Congress? You know, it, it's important that when you care, you keep doing something. I, I'm running because I care. I care about progress. I care about people, public safety, public health. There's so many issues that the community that I'm seeking to represent has in front of them. You know, uh, we often talk about the criminal justice system, but having been the state attorney, there's so many issues that fall under that umbrella when a person is brought into the criminal justice system. If we start with issues of uh, violence, gun violence, we're talking about victims of crime. Once a person is brought in and charged, you're looking at immigration issues, you're looking at voting restrictions, you're looking at housing limitations, job limitations, and right now important to Florida, your voting rights. So we have to have someone who understands it, who's been in the trenches, and who will do something about it. What are your uh, top three issues if you elected to Congress? Yeah, it's definitely going to be the social uh, and justice and criminal justice reform because of all of those issues that fall underneath it. But in addition to that, I'm a cancer survivor. So I care about health care, not just being able to get universal health care, but most importantly, being able to have accessible and quality health care for all people, not just those who have access to it. When we look at what happened with COVID, we saw all of the disparities. So health care is going to be important. We Down here in Florida, the climate matters when it comes to our our waterways. We're, we're surrounded by water, but we also have to make certain that we're addressing the climate and the environmental issues in the urban areas that often get slighted. So I'm going to be looking at climate, health care, racial justice, social justice issues, and um, so, so many other issues that are impacting people. Uh, obviously, uh, we're also dealing with uh, economic, black economic social justice. And so uh, what is your agenda for that? Because that's a huge, huge issue uh, that we're seeing. The federal government, uh, when it comes, I know for a fact, for advertising only spends 1% mm -hmm. of its media dollars with black-owned firms. Uh, we see African-Americans and other agencies uh, not being able to access those dollars. And so what about black economic social justice? Black economic social justice has got to be a priority. If you look at all the businesses that failed and that went under during COVID, those are small black businesses in our community. When you look at the housing crisis, affordable housing is a major issue that keeps a lot of people from being able to be involved in it and, and ultimately purchase and escape a generational poverty. So we, when you look at the economic issues, especially for black people, those are the things that matter. Unemployment, education, the student loan issues, small businesses, and certainly um, the ability to get a job and to have access to affordable housing. All right, then. Well, look, uh, you got to raise a whole lot of money. You got to go shake a lot of hands. And so, uh, but first, we got to see uh, the actual announcement. Uh, I, we've been hearing that she's going to run for the United States Senate, but it hasn't been fully uh, announced yet, confirmed. But uh, we certainly will be watching in this congressional race uh, very closely. Aaron, Ms. Ayala, we certainly appreciate it. Thanks a bunch. Thank you so much, Roland. All right, then. Uh, folks, uh, as I said, we're here uh, in Tulsa. One of the things that, while this was happening today, of course, uh, uh, the family of Ronald Green, they were at the state capitol in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, demanding justice in that case. He, he is the young man who police initially said had crashed into a tree and died when, in fact, he was, he was severely, severely uh, tased, uh, assaulted, really um, just brutalized. Uh, his case is under investigation by state and federal authorities. A couple of officers have actually uh, lost their jobs. Um, Reese, this is one of those uh, cases again. Uh, two years ago, he was killed. The family is there uh, in, uh, they were there in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, uh, demanding justice. Uh, and, and this is just, again, one after another, where we have to yell, kick, scream, uh, uh, holler, act a fool to get justice. And then they released the, released the video, and we see exactly what happened. But they lied to this man's family, saying he died in a car crash when they know they tortured this man to death. Oh, it's it's just never ending, and it's crazy how, like you said, this is something that happened two years ago, and it's now just coming to this to this um, to this level of attention to it. And that's the importance of body camera footage. I remember when the whole defund the police argument was going on and they were against body cams because they said it increases funding for for police departments. But how in the hell are we supposed to know what's really happening to people without body cameras? Because we for damn sure cannot rely on the cops to tell the truth about what is going on.
And so it's 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 sickening. It seems like it's never ending. Um, you know, to a lot of people say you cannot train this behavior out of people. You can't even pass laws to prevent this kind of behavior. The only thing that we could try to do is try to make it so that there is actual punishment and accountability in these cases, but it does not bring a Ronald Green back or all of the lives that we've lost to police brutality back. Uh, this, folks, uh, is some video that I'm playing right now. It was on Twitter. Uh, the family going to the state capitol, uh, demanding justice in the case of Ronald Green. Uh, we can, uh, Amisha, you can talk over this. Uh, and again, two years. Th this family has to, has to, has to go there, uh, and, and, and hold marches and, 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 uh, and do all of this sort of stuff. Uh, and then people wonder why black folks uh, don't believe in the justice system. Well, when the police sit here and lie and then uh, make and, and literally lie about what happened, the camera tells a different story. They even then they even tried to hide one of the cops tried to hide his body camera footage. You're, you're absolutely right, Roland, and it's frustrating. This is another layer of what we already knew about a lot of these police brutality cases, what we already knew about police covering covering for themselves and, and their cop friends. But it's beyond just body camera footage because the footage was available. The footage was available immediately. We're talking about something that didn't just happen last week, two weeks ago, three weeks ago. This man's family buried him a while ago. We're talking about years at this point. And there has been zero accountability. My frustration isn't just the fact that there was body cam footage. Body cam footage can exist, and, and it's great when it does. However, when it exists, and you can clearly see on it the length of brutality, the extent of a 49-minute video of this man being beaten, bloody, cursed out, um, being made fun of, and you know you're hearing all of these um, all of these racial epithets. You're hearing them talk about the possibility of AIDS. You're seeing them use hand sanitizer to wipe the blood off of their hands after they've literally watched this man die and offered no form of aid. The problem I have with this is that the police had it the entire time. The, the, um, the investigators had it the entire time. There is at no point anyone who looked back and said, this is wrong. These guys should be pulled off. There should be a, an investigation. They should be charged with murder. Nothing for how long. <laughs> so it's not just the presence of body cam, because body cam doesn't mean a darn thing if you're not going to pursue legal ramifications when police officers act outside of that badge and commit murder. So I think that for that family, my heart goes out to them because they've been trying to fight for justice for so long. But also the full recognition that these police reports don't matter because they essentially lie more often than not. But also that body cams don't matter in many cases. This case did not have a young girl out with her cell phone taking a camera footage, taking camera footage and putting it on social media and showing the world. This was people largely dependent on the police officers themselves being held accountable by the body cam footage that they had. And that simply did not happen. Dr. Greg Carr, we're playing video right here of the protesters who are blocking one of the roadways there uh, in Baton Rouge. Uh, they want one to get folks' attention. Uh, at the end of the day, you got to do what you got to do. Well, Roland, what, you're, what we're seeing right now is uh, what you just showed is a justification for the white nationalists in this country who are working feverishly at the state level to introduce legislation and pass legislation to allow white nationalists to run over protesters. Um, this mm. is not a country. In the words of Mother Viola Fletcher last week, she said, I think about the horrors inflicted upon black people in this country every day. She's 107 years old. With all, again, due respect to Representative Clyburn, the difference between qualified immunity and this piece of federal legislation and not qualified immunity is the difference between a full loaf of bread and a piece of paper with the word bread written on it. Brother, don't, mm. don't, let's be serious here. Let's be serious. The reason, as, as Amisha just laid out very powerfully, the reason they can joke, the reason they can spray hand sanitizer trying to get the blood off their hands is because, contrary to what those cowards say with their bird chests when they stand up in a court of law, they do not fear for their lives. It is time for them to fear for their lives. It is time for their children and their husbands and their wives to fear for the loss of their homes and their children's uh, future inheritance. It's time for them to literally fear for their lives because see, here's what's going to happen. Here's what is going to happen. 
we're going to get the message that if the police pull you over, you better be strapped and you better be ready because, as Ice Cube said, rather be judged by 12 than carried by six. So let's get serious, Representative Clyburn. Either it's qualified immunity and you roll back the judge-invented doctrine of qualified immunity that came into existence in the 60s and then was reinforced and greatly expanded in the 1980s. Some of us can read law cases too, brother. Or prepare yourself for what comes next because one of these days we're going to get the message and that message is not going to be very kind to these killer death squad cops and their fake punk ass attorneys that back them up and the cities that pay rather than them pay and break up these damn police unions. Qualified immunity has to go, brother. They have to be punished. That's what will back them off us. Folks, um, earlier today, uh, across from the Greenwood Cultural Center, uh, they had the unveiling of that uh, Tulsa uh, mural. We had the opportunity to talk with the artist, uh, a white man from Maryland, who talked about uh, how uh, he was moved by it and then explained to us, explained to us, uh, walking us through exactly what his vision was to illustrate what took place 100 years ago in the community of Greenwood, where 36 blocks were torched by racists here in Tulsa. You said when, um, at the tip to introduce you, right. that when you got the call uh, to do this, um, you had no idea about I, this I, issue. I had no idea. I had it was never taught to me. It was a blank. I had to, I had to look it up. You, you know, born and raised where? I was born in 1959, raised in Florida, military family, you know, public schools, Florida State University, never once, you know, heard anything about it. And uh, how, how were you selected? Who, so who, who chose you? Uh, I think uh, Randy Vaughn, the gentleman right there, uh, knew my work, saw the Harriet Tubman mural. And Harriet Tubman mural where? Uh, Harriet Tubman mural in Cambridge, Maryland, on the okay. side of the Harriet Tubman Museum. Got it. And Visitor Center. Uh, or educational center, and again, it was it, you know, it was a powerful, powerful image of a powerful, powerful woman. That when you tap into the stories that you're telling, you if you don't get, if I didn't get emotional, if I can't get emotional, I'm not doing my job. A, but B, as a human being, you know, you, uh, so out of out of the hair, as a human being, you, you you have to to experience it in order to feel the pain. Of the person and the people that you're you're conveying, but even as as just human beings walking the planet, to understand why the black perspective is has an issue with any of a number of things, and when you start to tell the story, you start to realize, it, you know, the the complete mistreatment and abuse of a race simply because of the color of their skin. Uh, it gets really heavy. And I, I don't say, I mean, I say that, but I mean, I, I feel it when I paint. Mm -hmm. And when Randy called me about doing it, uh, and I think it was because of the Harriet Tubman mural, because for that one, it was the same thing. I don't take lightly that I'm a white man painting a black story, but I'm also a human being painting a human story, you know, and that we should be able to tell each other's story, you know. And the, the, the disadvantage to the black artist is that the white, the the white population is not hiring black artists to tell a white story, and I can attest to how much empathy and, and, and how much uh, you learn about yourself and the people you're painting about by being asked to paint that story. So, uh, you know, so and I, and I think I try to convey that to my work, and I think that's probably why, in answer to your question, they asked me to paint it. Um, take us through uh, your process um, to visualize this. Uh, what research yeah. did you do? Right. How often did you travel here? Did you talk to people? Right. Uh, just take us through that process. I will. Um, I had a lot of conversations with Randy and Dr. Crutcher about what it is uh, th they were trying to convey, what they wanted you know me to to express through the painting. Uh, the amount of research, you know, listening to podcasts, reading uh, historical articles, just reading everything I could about what happened that day. Uh, I didn't have the opportunity to travel out here. I mean, it's my mm -hmm. first time in Tulsa, but I this think... Is your first time here? In Tulsa, okay. yeah. And so I, I, I think, I mean, that's the beauty, obviously, of the Internet now, is that you can you can pretty much get a picture of, of, of what it is and what happened through all the, you know, all the documentation. But what you don't get is what you saw today was that that human level, that emotional level, and, and, and sometimes it just doesn't 
work that you can travel, you know, either you're working on other projects and getting out to, to meet, you know, the people face, face to face, it just, it's not feasible. It's, it may not be in a budget. At the same time, you know, the beauty of the internet again, Zoom, you know, you can, I can have a conversation right. with you over the internet and at least I, I have contact with you, which I did with them. So, uh, but uh, yeah, my first time here and so how did also, you settle? Yeah. So how did you settle? On, so right. on this, and yeah. so because you had the different. So well, you just, know, so we're gonna get the microphone oh, yeah, here, Anthony. Sure. So just, right. yeah. just stand on that side right there. Okay. So just explain right. the different elements of sure. this mural. Well, when I was having right. when I was having the conversation with Dr. Crutcher, you know, she was she was telling stories, telling me about, and I had also read the stories, but the first hand account, you know. Of, of running down the street uh, with her mother being chased by white men uh, and you know you just had to read about about the white community deputizing 500 people and being told to make something make it happen you know these are and, and, and you know the deputies allowing it to happen I mean I would say you know the the, uh, the police force at that time allowing that community the white community to burn down burn down a town and kill uh, those are truths that you can't gloss over. I mean, that's the truth that gets swept under the carpet. That's what has to be, you know, when you look at that in this painting, you want to know who is that person. Why is there a white guy and they're holding a gun? Why are they loading bodies onto a flatbed truck? And when you start to do your research, you start to realize that's what happened. They loaded bodies, dead bodies, onto trucks and took them to mass graves. You know, uh, in, you know that, you know, the white community made sure that they could, you know, that they went into every house you know, and in, in, in every business to, uh, to uh, you know, and destroy it. The whole goal was to destroy it and, and get rid of all evidence and, and then to, to pillage what was in every one of those houses. Uh, that has to be addressed. You know, you, you, you have to feel, as a white person, you have to look at that and be a little bit shocked that, you know, wow, yeah, I don't feel that, but someone did feel that. And they did this. And that person and the consequences of that action was what's right there in the center, which is a loss of a husband, a father, you know, of a future, you know. And got the child flushing. The child, yeah. yeah I, well, you know, my, my dad died when I was seven years old uh, in Vietnam, so I never saw him. He never came back. He's MIA. Uh, and I remember my mom, my mom screaming, you know, when they came over. And I remember what it feels like, you know. You know uh, what it felt like as a child to uh, you know to have your dad no longer there. The difference was I still had a community, I still had a house, I still had you know uh, a, a rem you know a, a family a, a surrounding me, a military family. This child doesn't. This, I mean, to be that boy at that age and have this happen, you can't comprehend at that age what happened. Except you were afraid, but you. But, you know, when he turns 15 or when he turns 17 or when he's 20 years old, you're going to start to he'll start to feel all the pain that he's feeling at that moment. And as a, as a viewer, I, I think and it's important of, of, of public art that tells a story like this. You have to be able to put yourself as a viewer into that boy's mind, into that woman's heart and mind and, and to feel the devastation of, of death. You know, and you've got to be able to look at the white community, your community and right. say, they did this, you know. And, and you also have that, that, that plane. The airplane uh, did. As well, and what people don't realize is uh, they covered this in the 60 Minutes piece as well. Right. That this was the first time planes had been used to terrorize American citizens. Yes. Not 9 11. Yes. What happened here in Absolutely. Tulsa. This, this massacre. And is the orange. Let's well, see. The orange is it represents fire, but right. obviously a lot of this fire would already be gone. Right, right. So I had to come up with a style that wasn't fire, but. It felt like fire. But it also starts, didn't you also start after sundown? So you sort of have yeah. sun setting, Exa so it sort of gives, gives Yeah, smoke. which is why you get that, that kind of long shadow. This is either early morning or late in the evening. But right. so you get your, and you, you, just as a technique, you know, you want your eye to go right to the people. The other story you will eventually learn as you look at it. But when you look at the immediate impact of this mural, you want it, I want it right in the center. I wanted all the lines converging into her because that, that's the legacy that that's what happened you know what happens after this moment on this porch uh who knows i mean was she able to rebuild was that boy able to go on and and, and live a prosperous life i don't know but we as a viewer have to confront that and say you know we, this can't happen we can't this kind of hatred 
and, and, and we know it's still out there. I mean, we're, we're not fooling anybody that, you know, that uh, there are still people with that kind of hatred in their hearts. And, and uh, it's, I think the more you tell the story, the more people, like I do, after telling the story, I despise that hatred now. I mean, I, 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 before you understood it was there, but until you really start to tell a story and feel the empathy of those that are affected by that, you don't, re you know, that's when it has an impact. And that's how, as an artist, I'm changed by telling these stories. I mean, and it's, uh, I take incredible pride uh, in A, telling the story, telling the, the black heritage story, telling the black story. I'm not black, but as a human being, we all are, you know, and if I can't get into that story, then how can I ever, how can we ever, you know, move on? We, then, then yeah. On the side over yeah, man. Here, you sure. You have, again, you have, uh, you have a, a woman, looks like her daughter, that's right. trying to escape. Right. Exactly. And then you have his wife pointing, pointing them out. Chasing him down. Get, get them. them. Get them. Absolutely. Because that's what happened. I mean, there's no denying that, that that happened all day long. It's documented, rounded up, you know, taken it, taken to wherever at the time they, they took them. Uh, or ran complete, run completely out of town. And if you resist it, shot. You know, so the word massacre is powerful. But the story of a massacre is even greater than the power the word gives because y you, you suddenly realize that this happened to human beings. And it only happened because the color of their skin. You know, the, the, the hatred and the jealousy that it took to do that, I can't comprehend. You know, as a human being now, it's, it's impossible. But I know it happened, and you've got to capture that. And hopefully I, I did. You know, I mean, that was my goal. All right. Mike, we certainly appreciate it. All right. Uh, absolutely. Thanks a bunch for uh, uh, walking, us through, walking us through this. I All right. Well, it. I appreciate it, too. And I, uh, you know, it's my honor, actually. All right. Thanks a bunch. Right. I appreciate you, you it. You got it. You got it. So, folks, we're here broadcasting from the offices of theblackwallstreettimes.com. Uh, they were supposed to have a big celebration, their grand opening, but a massive storm came through and they pushed it to Saturday. Uh, they had a virtual uh, program. If you go to their Facebook page, uh, you can check it out. Uh, and then also, uh, I'm going to ask the founder and chief, does he, do, does he, we like for us to actually restream it on Roller Martin Unfiltered. Uh, I'm sure he wouldn't mind getting a, getting a, a few eyeballs, uh, for that stuff. Uh, Nehemiah Frank Jones is right now. This is, so this is the magazine that they actually put out, folks. You see, we have it right here. You see the po poster here. The Black Wall Street Times, Greenwood, uh, 100. Um, and so, how you doing, man? Great, it's nice to be on your show. Uh, so, so, expl so explain us exactly what is the Black Wall Street Times. Y'all launching, what is it? Yeah, so the Black Wall Street Times has actually been around since 2017. Today we just uh, released our uh, Greenwood 100 magazine okay. to commemorate the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre. But, you know, more so to to talk about the deep history that has caused, that has culminated into, you know, what became the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre. And so and that's just white supremacy and, and racism. Uh, now, uh, but, but you're also a digital company. Yes. So uh, share with folks what y'all have been doing, what kind of, what kind of work you've been doing, right. uh, and, and where can people actually check out the work? Yeah, so you can check out the work uh, on the uh, blackwallstreettimes.com uh, or the bwstimes.com. Uh, and yeah, so we, like, we've, been, we've been doing this since 2017. A lot of the work is... Uh, locally focused mm -hmm. but if there's a story that breaks nationally or that we think could break nationally then we you know tend to to focus nationally so so what are you pushing out is it written stories is it video do you have audio podcasts oh, yeah all of the above we have all of the above we have the written uh, pod, uh we have a podcast we have um a written work that we put out every single day um and then we publish once a year Okay. So we published a newspaper. This year we decided to publish an actual magazine. So the magazine, I would say, is, is similar to the 1619 Project. Uh, how has uh, the company grown uh, in, in the four years? Yeah, so, I mean, it started with me. It was pretty much just a blog at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I wanted to clap back at Trump and, you know, <laughs> tell folks about, you know, about my history. I wanted to elevate my people and my community. You from and, here? Yeah, I'm from here. Born I am, and raised? I am uh, born, wasn't raised. My dad was in the military, lived every, everywhere, um, all across the country. But, yes, I am a Black Wall Street legacy. My uh, family on my dad's side, they were here pre-massacre. They uh, stayed after the massacre and rebuilt. Uh, questions for our panel. I'm going to repeat it to you since I have IFB. Uh, so questions from our panel. Uh, let's start first with uh, Misha Cross. Uh, any questions for uh, Nehemiah Frank? 
Absolutely. Um, over the years, you've been doing so much work there. Um, how is it that you're creating the, the, the narrative of this story today for fresh eyes? There are so many people that still um, have misconceived notions or honestly weren't taught the full legacy of what happened in Tulsa. How are you um, reimagining that and showcasing it for your audience now? Uh, yeah, so um, I would say we're definitely showcasing that through Greenwood 100. Uh, it has a set of, uh, you know, f f uh, photographs or images that are, uh, um, I would say, caution, right? You would definitely want to make sure you're prepared to, to, to see these images. And uh, we, we even go deeper. We talk about, uh, you know, why the, the race massacre happened in the first place. What were the seeds of, of the race massacre and, and the importance of, of just teaching it? Uh, so, Yeah. Uh, let's see, uh, Reese, your question for uh, the founder, editor in chief of the Black Wall Street Times. Yes, um, you know, I applaud what you're doing, but we also have to recognize that people have very short attention spans and you won't necessarily capture as many people with something in depth. Is there any way that you have been able to reach people in a more like concise or uh, maybe like a meme form? Do you think that that could be effective? I mean, I know, obviously, I'm not saying that you can really capture the, the, the whole essence of the massacre in that form. But at the same time, we know people have very, very short attention spans. Most people don't even read an entire caption on an Instagram post. Is there some way that you are able to reach that, that particular demographic, or is that not even something you think is even worth trying? Mm, that's a really good question. Um, I would say that a lot of the, the learning comes through a the journalistic activism that we do. Um, so mm -hmm. if there's a potential, uh, you know, if there's a, a policy that, that we want to, you know, push up against, um, we don't just do journalism here. Like, we are trying to protect our people. And so we'll do a call to action right through our, through our media outlet because if it, if it impacts black people in an adverse way, uh, you know, we're going we're gonna, to uh, mobilize our people and we're going to show up. And so, you know, then we create with that, we create, uh, you know, more energy around our causes. So other media outlets that are, you know, uh, I would say with, that have majority white journalists, you know, they're more likely to pick up, um, you know, our stories and, and, and help amplify our causes. Greg Carr, your question for uh, Nehemiah Frank. Brother Frank, and thank you, Roman. Um, we're all readers here, so we're good. In fact, brother, I went on your website, and I know Roland is going to instruct you to tell other people how to do the same. I bought a copy of the newspaper that's coming out now that's about to ship, the one from last year, and I got a coffee mug just on top of that, because otherwise I'd ask Roland to put an extra copy of that in his bag. But this really ties to the question I want to ask you. I'm thinking about Mother Fletcher again last week here in D.C. testifying when she said, I've never made much money. To this day, I can't afford my, barely afford my everyday needs, and all the while, the city of Tulsa has unjustly used the names and stories of victims like me to enrich itself and its white allies through the 30 million raised by the Tulsa Centennial Commission while I continue to live in poverty. Mm -hmm. 107 years old. Brother, let me ask you this as you sit there with our brother Roland Martin in black owned and black controlled spaces while all of our friends, including Cornell West and Hill Harper, a couple of our frat brothers, are going to be there all next week with the shiny stuff. Can you help us understand the, and, and understand the difference between where you are and what you all are doing and what's going to surround you in this flood of attention over the, la the next week? How can we distinguish between what's what and how can we support you? Because we know that's black on black control. Yeah, that's good stuff right there. I like that. Um, yeah, so the community is putting on the, the Black Wall Street Legacy Fest. And that is led by uh, our spearhead, I would say, uh, by the one and only Dr. Tiffany Crutcher. She is the force uh, in this state. Um, she is, you know, she's remarkable. Her, she is unwillingness, her unwillingness to uh, compromise, you know, in, in, unless the right thing is done is, is, has really helped, you know, drive a lot of the activism and the change that has happened in this city. Um, and, and recently, you know, John, and this is this just happened. This is just new news. Uh, John Legend and, and, and Stacey Abrams have pulled out of the Centennial Commission's event. Um, right. And it's it's. I mean, that just shows the type of you know power that she has, and uh, the community is is completely following her. 
um, as far as like Mother Randall and Mother, uh, Mother Fletcher and, and Uncle Red, uh, I was in D.C. with them uh, at the Capitol building uh, when they were testifying. And my goodness, like their resilience to last this long. Um, you know, we, we had a chance to meet the vice president of the United States, Kamala Harris. And just in that, in that 30 minutes that we had with her, she showed more compassion and grace and empathy to the living survivors and just that in, in 30 minutes than the city of Tulsa has shown to them in a hundred years, mm. you know? And I think that that is, you know, that's something to be said about, you know, the wickedness in this place. Uh, you know, my hope is that through the Black Wall Street Legacy Fest, through the community mur murals that are going up and, you know, the events, the, the education that we're putting out, I um, mean, of course, through the Black Wall Street Times that we're able to continue to, uh, you know, show people, you know, our perspectives, um, you know, and how we bring change, in, you know, in, the, in, a, in a very red state like, like uh, Oklahoma. Um, explain, um, first of all, I mean, obviously, I understand the importance of, of black-owned media. Um, and so, so is there a black newspaper in town? Is there, so what's the status of black media here being able to tell the story and control the narrative? Mm. Uh, yeah, so um, the Black Wall Street Times is, is of course, here. Uh, we don't print daily or anything like, like the Tulsa World, but, you know, a lot of people are moving. And, and, and the Tulsa World is a daily newspaper. Yes, it's a daily newspaper. Uh, there's the Oklahoma Eagle, and then there's the, uh, the, the, Black, Wall Street, the Black Wall Street Times. Uh, in 1921, when the, the black media stations were, or the black publications were burnt down, there were only two back then. Um, but, yeah, like, you know, we're, we're pushing, we're driving the narrative. Uh, they don't always listen to us. Last, I think it was like two weeks ago, the uh, governor of the state, uh, they, their comms team wouldn't even pass any information to us. Like, just think about that. Like, the government, we are paying taxes to you, but you're not even sharing, you know, information with us. And so uh, one of uh, our journalists reached out in, for, for a comment and, you know, we got this nasty email back from the governor's, uh, the governor's team and, and the, the comms person pretty much said that, you know, we don't respond to uh, activists pretending to be reporters. It was the most, it's just a very disrespectful email. And so, you know, just from that, like all of the media, even the white folks, even the white media was going after them like, wow, how could you say that to them? Like they do excellent reporting too. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, important of, of driving, you know, the narrative. Uh, yeah. Last question for you. Um, what do, um, what do you see of this five years from now? What do you, what do you want the Black Wall Street time to look like five years from now? Uh, I think Dr. Crutcher summed it up pretty well. Uh, I would like to, uh, you know, be next to the root and next to the grill. I don't want to replace them. I love the work that they do. Um, I would like to be next to, uh, uh, you know, the Roland Martin show. Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. So, so you want to actually, you actually want to broaden it uh, beyond just Tulsa. Absolutely. Gotcha. Yeah. Because, they, because th this was, wasn't the only place where they had Black Wall Street. Right. There were, others, there were other there were. black communities. Yeah, absolutely. And there are other communities that need, uh, you know, that need black media. Absolutely. To, to help amplify their stories and, you know, why, why their lives matter. All right, then. Well, we certainly appreciate it. Uh, glad you let us uh, uh, camp out at your location. I know you got another event to get yeah. to, but we appreciate uh, you sitting down talking with us at Roller Martin Filter. Thank you for having me. All right, thanks a bunch. Also, hold up. So, folks, the website, theblackwallstreet.com. Okay, people are asking on YouTube and Facebook. They want to know how can they get a copy of the magazine. Can they order one? You can order uh, on the online store. Okay, online store as well. And see, y'all, he's rocking the gear. Y'all, normally I have my unfiltered gear. I don't have any. Uh, but I, the people, they're asking us what they want to know. Can they buy gear? Yes, you can buy the gear on the website, too. See, there you go. They ain't got no problem making money, selling y'all some stuff. Uh, <laughs> if y'all buy it, support the black owned. Nehemiah, I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. All right. Uh, Grant Carr, uh, you got all them books stacked behind you. Uh, I, uh, sh uh, sh surely, Greg, I know you pulled out uh, your books related to the Tulsa uh, Massacre of 1921. Take it away. Only a few. Only a few. I did have a few around, brother. I, I'm going to resist the urge 
This hey, look, all these cats are gonna be at the official thing, Roland. I mean, uh, Hannibal Johnson's gonna be there. It's a great one called Black Wall Street 100, right? This great, um, even children's books. Alvarine Bill and Stacey Robinson did Across the Tracks. This is for young people, children. You can see that one there. It's called Across the Tracks, which talks about it as well. Um, the Burning. This is a YA piece. Young adult, uh, Tim Madigan redid this. This if you got an eighth grader or a ninth grader. And then just two others right quick. Carlos Hill. In fact, in fact, in fact hold tight, hold tight. Well, oh, Greg, Greg, hold on one second. Greg, hold on one second, because I want I want to talk about that. So Tim Madigan and I worked together at the Fort Worth Star Telegram. Uh, and uh, Tim Madigan, uh, white guy, grew up in Iowa. And it wasn't until he was doing the research and and it hit him. And when he heard these stories, and I remember we did the interview and he talked about uh, uh, a, a black couple uh, on their knees, elderly black couple praying in their living room and, and guns are put to the back of their head and, and, and their heads are blown out. And Tim said to me, he said, Roland, all these years when these racial things would happen, when OJ would happen, he said, I would, he said, I would be like, what's wrong with black people? Why are folks tripping? He said it was not until he did the research for that book, he said, where he understood black pain. He said Tulsa and the research put into perspective for him a white man growing up in Iowa who never saw black people until he went to college, who never knew anything about this history. And he was, he was almost in tears and he said for this to happen, he said, and he was angry, he said, because he grew up and had no idea. So um, uh, I'm going to try to find that interview uh, that, that, that we had. I'm sure he's going to be here. I probably will cross paths with him. But that's actually uh, a very good book. And like I say, a former colleague of mine in Fort Worth. Go ahead. No, Roland. In fact, I almost we should almost end with that, brother. I, the only other, I got two more in my hand, and there are no, many, no, no, many. No, 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 you got some other. No, no, no. Show, show your, show your. No, no, show your other stuff. I got no, time no, no, gone. I, no, I just like I say, I I got a bunch more that I didn't pull, but I want to show just two more. Uh, one is called the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre. Carlos Hill, who's going to be there next week again. See, the problem is the folk next week have all the money. That's what Mother Fletcher was saying. Y'all making money. Y'all have got this one of their funded corporate sponsors. But this is an excellent book because he not only talks about what happened in 21, he talks about the fact that they rebuilt and he shows the pictures and the photographs. And then he takes us into the moment where we see the highways come through and all the redlining and stuff. And then he ends with the personal testimony of many of the survivors, all of whom, almost all of whom are ancestors now. And the last one I'll end with, and as you, as you interviewed the brother, I thought to myself, the muralist, I said, you know, it's good to have him. The great Ed Dwight did a sculpture there at the John O. Franklin Reconciliation Park. Uh, the same sculptor who's done so much work everywhere, including the South Carolina State Capitol. But brother, I said, you know, are there no black muralists? And the cover of this book, which is a children's book, uh, Floyd Cooper, who is a Tulsa native, now lives in um, Pennsylvania, did the cover of this book and the illustrations. This is a children's book unspeakable, the Tulsa race massacre. Look at the cover. Hmm. That looks way better. <laughs> oh, my God. Can you understand? You know, and that is, that's the cover. So, of course, mm. when you open it, it's the full mural. You know, are there no black murals? Mm. You know, mm -hmm. think about the fact that this is a collaboration between a black man and a black woman, Carol Bo Boston Weatherford and Floyd Cooper. There they are. Mm -hmm. Carol and Floyd Cooper. I'm not saying other people can and shouldn't participate. It's the only way that this place is going to make it. However, at moments like this, at moments like this, that would be black hands that apply, that apply paint to the side of buildings. With all mm -hmm. due respect, everyone else can help. But I just, you know, I just want to end with that. And get this, get this book for your children. Get this book for your children and let them sit with those images. So I'll start with that, Ron. Thank you, brother. Mm -hmm. um, also, let, let me say this here, folks, uh, and you knew this was coming. Uh, the Department of Homeland Security, uh, they actually have issued uh, a bulletin warning that uh, events uh, tied to the to this commemoration uh, could be the targets of white supremacists. Uh, that decision uh, came down. Of course, uh, President Joe Biden is going to be here uh, next week uh, as a result. Uh, but again, uh, that's what uh, has taken place. 
Um, and DHS sort of offered that. Uh, and I, I can confirm that the events uh, with John Legend and uh, Stacey Abrams uh, is, it was, what is stated there being postponed, uh, not canceled, postponed, no reason given. Uh, but I can confirm uh, what Nehemiah just told us uh, that uh, that the events that would have featured John Legend and Stacey Abrams uh, will not be taking place uh, this week. Got to go to a break. When we come back, uh, we'll be more from Tulsa. Also, we'll be talking with the Ghost Brothers. They got a series on Discovery. A lot of black folks saying, Ghosts? Really? Why not? We'll discuss next on Roland Martin Unfiltered. When you study the music, yeah. you get black history by default. And so no, no other craft could carry as many words as rap music. I try to intertwine that and make that create the, whatever I'm supposed to send out to the universe. A rapper, it, you know, for the longest period of time has gone through phases. I love the word. I hate I hate what it's become, you know, in, in to this generation, the way they visualize it. It's narrative kind of like has gotten away and spun away from, I guess, the ascension of black people. women have always been essential. Mm -hmm. So now mm -hmm. how are you going to pay us like that? And it's not just the, the salary. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are a whole number of issues that have to support us as women. Yeah. But that's what we deserve. Mm -hmm. That we shouldn't have to beg anybody for that. And I think that we are trying to do our best as a generation to honor the fact that we didn't come here alone and we didn't come here by accident. I always say every generation has to define for itself yeah. what it means to move the needle forward. Mm -hmm. Hey everybody, it's your man Fred Hammond. Hi, my name is Brisha Webb and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. Ow. Well, I like a nice filter usually, but we can be unfiltered. Do you believe in haunted houses? Well, my next guest uh, are three friends in Atlanta who say, yeah, this thing is real. They have a uh, hit reality series on Discovery's Travel Channel. Uh, joining us right now for the talk about the new season of Ghost Brothers Lights Out, uh, Juwan Mass, Marcus Harvey, and Daylin Spratt. They're called the Ghost Brothers. Gentlemen, how you doing? Um, no audio from nice. them or me? I can, can I can, I can. I can right, hear gentlemen. you. All right, gentlemen, gentlemen can y'all now hear me? I can hear yeah, you. Yeah, I, I can hear you. All right, then. Okay, all right. I want to make sure no ghosts are sitting here screwing up everything uh, <laughs> with y'all uh, feet there. Yeah, so y'all think, think ghosts are real? Man, bro, Man. You, you know ghosts real. You know ghosts real. Stop playing. You know, you know what it is. Folks, all traditionally... We've always thought, you know, only ghost that we play with is the Holy Ghost. Come on, church. So we've decided that we just wanted to see what that was going to really be. And it's actually uh, real, dog. It's, they really out here. They out here for real. So, okay. So for the, for the skeptical person out there, how do you know ghosts are real? Have they, talk, have, have they talked to you? Have, have you seen them? Uh, or have unexplained things going on? How, how you know Ghost Real? No, I'm going to be completely honest with you, man. A couple years ago, we was just like everybody else, sitting at the house, wondering the same questions. When we started doing this, I'm telling you, we have seen some of the craziest things that you probably ever imagined. I mean, like shadows walking through a room, not on the wall. <laughs> it ain't no lights on in the room. I mean, just a black figure walking directly in front of you in the room. Like, we seen some crazy stuff, man. 
<laughs> okay, now when you say we've seen some crazy stuff, so we're all three of y'all together that y'all see it individually, and so that and if you were together, y'all go, did you see that? Did you see that? We all saw that. And that y'all stay in the house. Man, it's crazy. No, we, and that's, <laughs> no I was just saying, it's crazy. Like, uh, if one of us are together, we always try to wait to see if the other person kind of saw it so we can be like, so we can have that validation. But we've caught it on camera. Uh, and I, we've caught it on camera. And that's like, that's the best right there, right? Like, that's the nail in the coffin when you can have it show and prove. Um, but typically, I'm the first one to run when, when, some, when something goes down. I'm not even going to lie. I'm out of there. <laughs> okay, first of all, how did y'all get together? Where did, the, where did this even start? Were y'all just sitting around talking and it was kind of like, man, I think we ought to do a ghost show. And then who said nah, you too high? <laughs> Juwan and I had just graduated from Clark Atlanta University. We were roommates at the time. And I remember it had to be like 3 in the morning, man. I woke up in the middle of the night, and I was just watching one of those Ghost Hunter shows. And I realized I never saw any reflection of myself on any of these shows. There was no black folks, no minorities, no young folks. And I was just curious to why black people didn't dabble in the paranormal. So I ran across the hallway to Juwan, bust through his door, and woke him up at 3 in the morning and told him, we need to hunt ghosts. And, uh, yeah, that, it, that didn't go the way I thought it would <laughs> at 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no. Bro, Roland, Roland, I'm going to be honest with you. My first thought was, like, are you sober? Like, bro, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, but I went back to sleep, woke up the next morning, and was like, man, you might be on to something. And, and from that point on, we decided to... Uh, Go see if ghosts exist. Yeah. Questions uh, from my uh, panelists. Reese, I'll start with you. Reese, have you ever seen a ghost, experienced a ghost, and are you scared of them? Hell yeah, I'm scared of ghosts. I watch all kind of horror movies. <laughs> right now, my daughter, she does this thing where she looking up. Sometimes she screams. Sometimes she giggles. I'm like, is it Casper the Friendly Ghost or is it an evil ghost? Let me know because we have an old house. Um, but my question is, how do you, how do you guys um, determine... You know, I, I read that one of you is on Zoom and then the other two go in there. Do you ever switch it up or um, is the one that's on the Zoom or like the one who's guiding, do you do you decide like I'm not going in no matter what? Like, because I'm, I'm trying to figure out how come all three of y'all don't get in on all the fun. And then my second question is, are you guys considering like writing a movie or making a fictional version of it? Um, those are my two questions. Yeah, yeah, to jump on right into that second question, we definitely are considering writing a movie. We're working on that now. Like, uh, yeah, I feel like that's the next progression for the Ghost Brothers. But to your first question, with this new series, we thought it'd be kind of interesting if one of us knew the history about the location, but the other two knew absolutely nothing. And their job is to go in that first round and see if they can get any information while in these locations that matches the actual story. Because if they can, they got to be some kind of proof out there that something's right, helping right. them out. You can obviously yeah. tell. You can obviously tell he's the one that sits outside, and we go in because like it sounded <laughs> really good. Like, it sounded like it was coming from a selfish place. Like you know, you were really protected. Yeah. Marcus and I be in that thing exposed, <laughs> bro. Wide open, man. We we be in like asylums, plantations. Like uh, churches, like everything that's crazy that uh, you know is beyond all belief is where we always get to go in first. And uh, we appreciate that, Dalen. We appreciate that, bro. I have one hey, more brother, question. Man, just playing. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I have one more question. All right, Reese. Um, Reese, go on with the second question. I'm sorry. I just want to know, have you guys ever, like, gone to a location and come home and been a little shook up? Like, uh, what's going on? Did a ghost follow us here? Nah, uh, man, nah. Listen, I'm married. Okay. So, I, I, I'll tell y'all real quick. Okay. I'm married. I'm married. So I'm married, and my wife don't play with that stuff. She's like, ain't nobody calling you boo. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Who's that boo? Uh-uh. Ain't no side ghost out here. She be like, uh-uh. Cut all that out. So I'm like, you know, before we even go anywhere, we be praying. We okay. have the sage, you know, all that stuff. We don't. We do make sure that we straight, for real, for real. Okay. Thank you, Reese. Red car. Rolling, 
brother. Well, first of all, Reese, your baby girl is in good shape because the Congo people believe that the folks who are closest to the ancestors are the ones who just came back from the other side. So she's probably in conversation with your great great grandmother. So she's good. Which leads me to the question I want to ask you, brothers, because if y'all went to Clark, Atlanta, you probably know the answer to this because you know my brother, Dr. Dan Black, who I'm very close to down here. Um, I'm okay. sure y'all know about Haints, Blue Haints, Bottle Trees. Duffy's out of Jamaica. In other words, there ain't no such thing as ghosts. There are only those who you can't see who are not in material form. I'm sure y'all know about those bottle trees and how to trap an evil spirit. I'm sure you know what haints are, whether it be South Carolina, Louisiana, or Florida. In other words, <laughs> those are ancestors. Yep. How y'all putting this black spin on this thing to help these people understand that the idea of being scared of your ancestors came out of Europe, brother? Help, help, help us. Hey, this is, hey first of yeah. all, Dr. Craig... You my favorite person on TV, period. I'm just gonna tell you like this. I watch you every night. And every time you do this, like, that little pushback, I'm like, I gotta listen. So, uh... um, We just, we just have respect for the, um, we just have respect for, like, um, whatever we're investigating. We look at it, like you said, with, um, honor that we know that it's just a, an ancestor or it could be just a person who just doesn't have an actual voice or a presence right now. So, that's typically how we get a lot of our um, our evidence too, because we're very cordial, we're very respectful when we go into mm-hmm. places, you know, and we're just a great a great uh, team, to be totally honest. That's beautiful. Yeah. We knew, we knew. Unless it's, right, uh, somebody, uh, unless it's the ancestor of a racist, at that point, y'all need to yeah. <laughs> but anyway, I didn't mean to interrupt. You. <laughs> no, I'm just saying, like, uh, well, we gentlemen, knew, uh, from, first of. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just saying, I, we knew from the very beginning that it was very taboo, the idea of dealing with spirits in the black community. Like I said, my mom was my head pastor of my church, so she'd been grooming me since I was in the third grade to, you know, to the ideology that any other spirits outside of God is something of the devil. You know what I mean? And so our biggest hurdle was just crossing that taboo within the black community. But I feel like we've been doing so. You know what I mean? We, 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 we spoon feed it by adding humor into our show and respect into our show and to show people that, you know, all the spirits out that you may encounter may not be on that negative side. And like you said, you could actually be out there reaching or speaking to one of your ancestors. One of our first shows was on a plantation, a slave plantation in Louisiana. And our interactions with those spirits were totally different than our white counterparts who had investigated there before. Oh, that's beautiful. That's All right, yeah. then. Yeah. Y'all, the, it's a new season. The show is called Ghost Brothers. Lights out. Uh, you can catch it uh, on Discovery Plus's streaming app. Uh, check it out. Uh, I certainly want to appreciate uh, Juwan, Marcus, uh, and Dalen for joining us right here on Roland Mark Unfiltered. Gentlemen, thanks a lot. Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Roll it. All right, then. Folks, that is it for us. I want to thank uh, uh, Nehemiah and the folks here at the Black Wall Street Times for allowing us to broadcast our show from here. Tomorrow, y'all, we're going to start early. A lot of events happening all throughout the weekend. We're going to be live streaming. We're going to have two crews uh, covering Tulsa. Uh, things left and right. You don't want to miss that. Uh, so, y'all, what you should do is set your notifications on YouTube and Facebook so when we go live, it pops up on your phone and you can see the events. I, hey, I haven't seen anybody else here. This is why we do what we do. We're black owned. Y'all know how we roll. Uh, it's important that we, that we uh, cover the issues that matter to us. That's why we're here. And so we want y'all to support us in every way possible. Uh, and so that's why we do it for you. Your dollars make it possible for us uh, to be here, for us to travel here. And so we believe in covering our story, controlling the narrative. We don't need to have white media telling us uh, what needs to be talked about with black America. Please support us via Cash App by joining our Bring the Funk fan club. Cash App, dollar sign RM Unfiltered. Venmo.com forward slash RM Unfiltered. PayPal is paypal.me forward slash R Martin Unfiltered. Uh, you can also uh, go to um, uh, Zale, Roland at RolandSMartin.com or Roland at RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. 
all 100% of money you give goes to support this show. If y'all get support us there on YouTube, remember we only get 55% uh, of the money that's given there. So give to us direct. Folks, we appreciate it. Uh, hey, if y'all on YouTube, hit that like button. We need y'all to like as many of our videos as possible because that's what allows for us to go up in the algorithm for them to recommend our videos. And when you recommend our videos, others get to be able to see it. And that also increases the money that we're able to generate here at Roller Martin Unfiltered. Uh, it's, man, we certainly appreciate it, y'all. Uh, thank you so very much. Uh, this is a great space. Uh, I love uh, what they have here on the walls. You know what? I might think about, uh, you know, I might think about doing that uh, in, in our new office space for Roller Martin Unfiltered. So I'm just saying, I'm going to get some ideas, take some photos here. All right, y'all, we got to go. Uh, I, I shall uh, see y'all tomorrow again. Uh, we're going to be live tomorrow on Roller Martin Unfiltered, but we're going to be live all day. And so we're going to be popping up on the live stream. So be sure to check us out. Uh, and we certainly appreciate it. Thanks a bunch. Greg Carr, Amisha, and Reese. it's always a pleasure. Thank you so very much. Uh, and folks, we always, we keep praying for our uh, regular Thursday panelist, Erica Wilson. I'm texting her. She's getting better. She's getting stronger. Y'all prayers uh, are working, and she certainly appreciates uh, all of them. Uh, thank you so very much. Don't forget to go to theblackwallstreettimes.com. That's their website. Follow them on Twitter, uh, on uh, Instagram, and also follow them on Facebook. That's it, folks. Y'all take care. Holla!